We are here to invite our colleagues to uh, join us on the panel for the session on the future of zero carbon energy. We only have an hour, so it's going to be a conversation. And the nice thing about having a smaller group is we can have an actual conversation. Uh, I feel, um, I won't say guilty, but I am responsible uh, for uh, this excellent panel of really smart people with a wide variety of experiences to, to bring to bear. I also uh, am going to take responsibility for the title of the panel, because to me, it's all about carbon, and we tend to be a little bit parochial, and so I keep reading things about is the renewable that, or the efficiency the other, or it's nuclear this, and they're all relevant, but we tend to lose sight, to me, the thing that really poses an existential threat to all of us is the carbon challenge. And so I don't like when I see fratricidal discussions among different ways to get there, and I will, uh, I think I have to, since he's six inches away, give credit to uh, Bob Armstrong and his colleagues at MIT, because I think the first place I read this was in the Future of Nuclear Power Study back in 2003, was it? Uh, and it said, in the old days, we used to ask if the future of our energy was fossil or nuclear or conservation, as it was then called, or renewables. And the answer is all of the above. You'll notice that is now the official policy of the United States of America. And so we've assembled a really uh, outstanding group to address this, we have uh, Bob Armstrong, who is the head of the MIT Energy Initiative, fondly known by its acronym MIT, which indeed it is. Uh, we have Tim Richards, who is the Managing Director for Government Affairs and Policy for the MENAT region. I guess that used to be MENA, but I'm glad since you're here it's MENAT. I figured that out. Uh, we are joined also by Laszlo Varro, the head of gas, coal, and power market division of the IEA. And uh, we are also joined by Michael Eckhart, managing director, global head of environmental finance, Citigroup. So just to, to frame this, I think when I left government, it was my intention to write a book about, I still get there, uh, I swear at one point, the two existential threats that we face as a planet, and one is nuclear terror, but the other is climate. Uh, this obviously addresses that second panel. And it is, in my judgment, all about carbon. And you'll hear different ways of getting at it. The people we've invited are going to address some of the critical issues that we face in terms of raising the capital required to make the investments, bring the innovation and technology to bear that will uh, accelerate the uh, decline of carbon. And uh, I do think that it's important to remain focused on how these pieces fit together and how, for example, the future of the electric grid can be made uh, to accommodate a zero carbon future more efficiently than the traditional hub and spoke model that FDR, Franklin Roosevelt, and others knew in the past. How do we get past the challenges of innovation in energy space having come out of venture capital and private equity where you had very high uh, cost of capital and needed a very high rate of return that might not be available at grid scale. And I think Michael Eckhart can bring some light on that. How do we deal with a situation in Southeast Asia, for example, where notwithstanding all of the concerns about carbon, the needs of a growing population and their energy requirements is leading to more, not less, use of coal? And he'll be able to ex uh, explain that. And then how do all these pieces fit together uh, and uh, work in some systematic way? And uh, Bob Armstrong and others will be able to address all of these questions. So um, with that, I am going to uh, stop talking, which is what I'm supposed to do since I'm only the moderator. And so let me just uh, uh, kick it off by, by uh, turning to you, Bob, uh, and asking, uh, I, true confession, have to admit that the series of studies that, that MITE has put out over the years the future of nuclear power, the future of the electric grid, the future of coal, the future of natural gas, most recently, I guess, the future of solar. These are, I'm uh, sort of proud to say my bedside reading, ter terrific books, each and every one of them. But, but my question to you is, here we are, you know, we're a weeks away from Paris. And we know that anything to create a full solution is going to require 
a blending together of all of these different technologies and all of these different approaches. If you, Bob, had to distill the learning of all these great studies that you've done into a thematic response that you, you know, you share with, uh, with our audience here, how do we make these things fit together and how quickly can that bring us to zero carbon? Thank you very much, uh, Dan. Um, for, first of all, I observe that you probably sleep well at night. <laughs> <laughs> if only you knew. <laughs> That's the last thing you le read before you go to bed. Um, so the, the future of studies that, that, that uh, Dan mentioned have uh, been, in fact, very interesting ways to bring uh, a diverse set of talent across MIT together, which, which is, in fact, uh, one of the, the goals of the MIT Energy Initiative, is to bridge across science and innovation and policy uh, to, to, to address the world's big energy challenges. Um, what we've learned through that process of doing this series of future of studies, looking at what we see as, as major technologies that could get us to a, a zero carbon uh, world in, in the future, is first of all the diversity of technology approaches that we're going to need to take. Uh, and that's reflected in, in the range of, of future of studies. Second is, is the, the importance of diversity of talent in going after solutions of those problems. Uh, th these are not just science and technology challenges, uh, but also involve uh, economic issues and policy issues that, if not addressed properly, uh, together with the technology issues, uh, will, will result in failure uh, to launch. Um, third are system issues. Um, how, do you, how do you string all these things together uh, to, to get a system uh, that, that works? Lots of interesting penetration of solar uh, going on in, in the world today. And, and yet we see as, as solar penetration increases, uh, the value of, of that solar to, to the investor goes down because uh, it's not dispatchable uh, as, as <laughs> is. Um, and in fact, the, the, the amount of, of non-solar generating capacity that you have to have uh, on, on standby uh, doesn't decrease as solar penetration increases. So how, how do you understand how that works in a system, right? So how do you integrate that with baseload resources like nuclear, um, like coal or natural gas with CCS uh, ultimately? Uh, how do those aspects work? And there's some other um, interesting system challenges that, that uh, have um, arisen as we've looked at these different technologies that, that, that we think deserve special attention. What, one of those is what happens to the evolving utility business uh, as we go forward with all these different technology advances. So it's clear there's more distributed generation on the grid, there's more distributed storage resources out on the grid, there's uh, an abundance of, of smart meters, uh, so-called smart grid technologies out there. There is some electrifying of transportation uh, going on right now. Uh, what, what, what is happening to the business model in the utility space and, and how can companies capture rents in the future? Mm. And if we can't figure that out, then we're not going to be able to, to Im embed these new technologies uh, into a viable market. The other one I'll mention is the transportation system. So how is that going to evolve uh, going forward? I think we all realize transportation is probably the hardest part of the energy system to decarbonize uh, because of the very special convenience of, of liquid hydrocarbon fuels. Uh, and, and what happens in that business, given rapidly evolving engine types and fuels and the mixtures of those, how those work together, uh, changes in, in consumer preferences, uh, the, the advent of autonomous vehicles, albeit at, at an early stage, mm. um, different regulatory uh, uh, scenarios. So lots going on in the transportation segment. Um, how is that going to change? Uh, how we do that part of the business. So th those are three takeaways, the diversity of technology, diversity of talent <clears throat> to bring to bear, and the need to look at the systems mm. in which those technologies sit. Thank you. That's a great way to tee it up. And let me just pause and, and make a couple of uh, housekeeping comments before we move on. Uh, this session is on the record. And English-Turkish translation is available using the headsets, which are available outside. Uh, if you have phones, please do put them on silent. 
and this is one, a new one for me, I don't know how to do this, but tweet using hashtag AC Summit, and the session uh, format uh, is what, what you've just observed. We're gonna have some Q&A, but let me, let me pick up on, uh, on the system piece of that, because I think give me a, a, a good launch point to, to turn to Mike. Uh, in terms of the systems, and specifically the traditional grid model, for decades, in the United States at least, the model has been to basically put everything up to the point of the meter and everything on the other side of the meter is up to the homeowner or the ratepayer. Uh, and now with electric vehicles charging uh, and smart uh, meters uh, and uh, demand response, uh, that Chinese wall, so to speak, is, is breaking down. And uh, we need to have, I think, new ways to think about it. Mike, I think you've been thinking about that and, and perhaps you could share your perspective you know, sometimes this goes under the moniker of, is it the future of the utility or the utility of the future? Well, uh, Dan, <coughs> thank you. Now, what is the button that I push? Uh, the red one in the middle there. The one in the middle? The big one. The big one. I want to start by saying, Dan, it's an honor to be on the panel with you. I, I've really admired your career and the work that you've done in leading our nuclear future uh, in the U.S. And it's a uh, uh, you know, you, you've been the quiet guy, not noticed, but doing the hard work. So it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, second, let me also just uh, uh, acknowledge that I work at City City Bank or City Group uh, now, and it's a wonderful place to work with the global presence, doing doing banking in 160 countries. Uh, phenomenal that an organization can do this well over the years and not make terrible mistakes and dealing with all the difficult money out there. It's just a, a, it's a real point of pride for me to be associated with this. And I'm, I'm here with uh, Baruch uh, uh, Basket, who's my, my colleague from the city here in Istanbul, who's come by today. So thanks for joining me here. Uh, quite a big bank uh, financing. <clears throat> and the key point, the only point I'll make is that we're a client bank. It's amazing. We're not looking for projects to fund we're looking for clients to finance, and this is an orientation of U.S. banks. So with that said, uh, Dan and I have been talking about a couple of aspects of the energy space, and I entered the business in 1976, which was a year after 1975, which is the year that the U.S. started the new energy technology R&D. So my career has spanned this whole thing, and it's been a great privilege. One of the interesting times was a General Electric in the early 80s, and I had to read the history books on, uh, from GE about what Thomas Edison did with the Thomas Edison companies and the whole thing. You have to know that stuff if you work there. And uh, one of the little anecdotes that stuck uh, was not a big point at the time, but seems to be a big point now, is the remarkable aspect of our electric utility side of the energy world that every utility in the world, without exception, has the same business model. This is amazing. Uh, China, India, US, Europe, they all sell commodity electricity to a customer meter, without exception. This is amazing. And how this happened was in the 1920s, there was a lot of uh, litigation lawsuits about electrocutions, people dying from electricity. And a lawyer somewhere at Con Ed in New York came up with the idea that all utilities to escape this legal liability should only sell commodity electricity. Every customer should have a meter, and the utility obligation would be to the meter. So if you were electro electrocuted on your side of the meter, that was your fault. We told you, that's your business. If you're electrocuted on our side of the meter, it's your fault, you're a trespass. <laughs> no more lawsuits. And this swept the world. Isn't that funny? <laughs> this is a true story. It swept the world. The, the lawyer told the CEO, this is what you're going to do. And this is, this is why this one business model has swept the world. Well, now we're talking about energy efficiency and customer services and so forth. And the problem, see, I, I'm in favor of the utility model. It provides a great a great public service. What I empathize is the difficulty of all of the electric utilities to get across the meter to serve the customer's interest. Now, the founder of Solar City is a great friend of mine, uh, and, and he has the idea 
that he has free reign to provide customer services on the on the customer side of the meter because the utility cannot reach him. Legally, he's not going there. Southern California Edison is not going on the customer side of the meter for legal reasons. He has free opportunity. And I have to say, I agree, that this is so embedded. And I think it's really the, a key issue in the electric utility industry, not the oil, gas, coal, fossil industry, thermal industry, but at least on the electric side, that we have preconceived and not well thought out today business models that are hindering our ability to move forward. And we have to rethink this, that why doesn't Southern California Edison serve their customers in their home with energy services? And why isn't that overseen by the California Public Utility Commission or in Russia or in India or in China uh, on this issue? And so you're raising a key point, and we, you and I have talked about this, that we're, 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 ca we're, we're caught in our business models that maybe we need to break out of to do new things. To do new things, uh, well, to do new things uh, suggests the phrase I've heard more than once about bringing good things to life. Uh, and uh, you refer to Thomas Edison, and we have his uh, Aaron successor uh, in the form of Tim Richards here. One of the three things Bob referred to was the need for new technologies. You've been innovating uh, for generations. Uh, what role technology, Tim, and what role, frankly, can uh, companies like GE have in accelerating this transition to zero? And, and since you are in business, uh, to the extent you can lash up the technology piece to what uh, Mike was just talking about in terms of the evolving, not to say eroding, uh, business model that we have uh, witnessed heretofore would be good. Great. Well, <clears throat> thank you, Dan. Um, good morning, everybody. It's great to be here. It's wonderful to sit, look out at the Bosphorus and have a chance to reflect on the, uh, the place we are and the place we are <coughs> metaphorically in terms of, uh, of the challenge of carbon emissions and a low carbon future. Um, thank you so much, Mike, for giving us that background on, um, on Thomas Edison. You know, when we think about, when GE thinks about the carbon challenge, it's in the context of being a company that has always believed that technology can change the world. And if you go back, the story Mike just told is about technology changing the world. And everything Thomas Edison did in creating GE and then in creating the Edison Electric Companies and the way in which that actually became the model for the world changed the world and brought the world our, our old slogan, we bring good things to life, but also brought, brought the world something that was fundamentally needed. And now we face another challenge, the, the challenge of carbon emissions. And our company has come into that with the premise that, of course it's solvable. Of course technology can be developed. Of course there are methods that can be used to come up with ways that we can maintain and improve our quality of life, continue to grow our economies, in fact, accelerate the growth of our economies and address the challenge of carbon emissions. So that's our perspective. Um, we fundamentally believe that the private sector has to play a major role in this process. In fact, the government alone cannot do it. The private sector has to make most of the investment, has to do most of the research, and has to deploy that technology. There are roles for government. We can talk about that a little bit more later. There certainly are roles for government. But the private sector has to be a, um, the major driver of most of the investment. And from our own point of view, we, we looked at this 10 years ago as we uh, recognized that climate change was real, that it was a major challenge, and therefore it was exactly the sort of thing that our company has in the past and should continue to be involved in. So we created a program we called Ecoimagination. We still have the Ecoimagination program. We set certain targets for ourselves in 2005, and um, we have exceeded all of those targets. So just as one example, we set out to invest $15 billion, $15 billion in Ecoimagination technology and products. And we have reached that level. And the technologies that we developed include things like more advanced wind turbines. We now have 30,000 GE wind turbines deployed globally. That's increased 10 times 
in the past decade during the course of our eco-imagination program. We've now developed the first gas turbine that uh, has exceeded consistently the 60% thermal efficiency barrier. And uh, so we now offer the most efficient gas turbine in the world, also part of our eco-imagination program, new nuclear technologies, and generally a wide range of efficiency technologies. Um, we've also just acquired the energy assets of Alstom. So we now have an entirely new set of technologies that fit really well into the GE portfolio. That includes hydro. It includes steam turbines, steam turbines for nuclear, and steam turbines that are more efficient for utilizing coal along with boilers. And it includes a uh, offshore wind turbine capability, which we didn't previously have. So it's a really nice fit with our existing GE portfolio. The, um, the other thing is we set targets for reducing our own greenhouse gas emissions because if we were going to be producing products that are intended to help others reduce their greenhouse gas emissions, we, we felt we needed to do it ourselves. So we set a 25% reduction target for ourselves. Uh, we ended up meeting that more than a year earlier than expected. And in fact, not only did we meet it, we ended up reducing carbon emissions by 32%, uh, so seven percentage points more than our target and we did it a year early. So we set ourselves a new target and now um, we're working to do an additional 20% reduction by 2020. Um, so this can be done, we are doing it, and um, we, we are continuing to invest in the products and services that allow it to be done further. The, um, the last thing I wanted to mention is a look to the future because all of this investment, oh, by the way, we're going to do $10 billion more investment in R&D in, um, in our eco-imagination product line between now and 2020. Um, but what's the big next thing? And for us, the big next thing is to transform ourselves yet again and become the world's first and foremost digital industrial company. And we speak about the industrial internet. And for us, the, the opportunity that's out there is to do for the industrial sector what the existing internet has done for consumer and social activity and to create a platform that is an operating system that can be utilized widely to create um, software, analytics, utilize sensors in interconnected pieces of equipment and drive efficiency through the entire system. And I think this is going to be transformative. We, just like when people started writing apps, which I think is fairly recent history, in fact, you know, the whole concept of writing apps for, for your iPad or your iPhone, the um, people had no idea what kind of apps were going to be developed. The, the, the idea that you would have millions of people around the world coming up with brilliant ideas for what you can do with these little Android or Apple devices um, was hardly even conceived of, except probably by Steve Jobs and a few others. And um, we think the same thing can be done in the industrial world. So that is a whole new way, it's a whole new slice at efficiency and carbon reduction. And we can talk further about how that would work. But I think that's another way in which the world's going to change in the very near future. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, this is such a rich cornucopia of issues that have been raised. I'm going to just try to I'll pull out one and then serve it up to Laszlo at the end because, Tim, you were talking, for example, about, and I think probably all of us in this room agree, the critical uh, role of the private sector. The assets are out there, the technology's out there, uh, the scale is out there. Governments just don't have uh, the scale to invest at the level. I can remember hearing out in Silicon Valley that capital markets move more money in a day than governments move in a year. And when you look at the trillions that are going to need to be invested, uh, it's critical. And to take just one of the examples you picked, and I've seen this uh, as I've watched GE over the years, this tremendous wind turbine business uh, was not, I think, unrelated to the benefits of the production tax credit, right? Absolutely. And so there is a critical role for public policy. Could be to the good, could not be to the good. And uh, in this latter uh, aspect, uh, I think uh, the I. EA continues to chronicle the continued subsidization of carbon use uh, in a you know, very large degree, and G20 obviously has taken up this discussion. Laszlo, can you talk to us about the role 
of public policies as you see across the world and, and you know the, the tremendous work I know you, you personally have done in Southeast Asia and elsewhere, how can public policies be aligned in such a way that they are net supportive of going to zero carbon? I, I have seen calculations, and I, I don't know if, how accurate, of the level of subsidization of carbon versus the le level of subsidization, subsidization of clean energy, and it's still vastly weighted in favor of carbon. Well, that, that, that is indeed true, although uh, these are in different locations. Uh, so the, uh, in order the, the fossil, fossil fuel subsidy problem concentrates, uh, first of all, in the Middle East, uh, where it is oil, uh, gasoline is incredibly cheap in the Middle East, uh, and also electricity in the Middle East, uh, which is generated from, uh, uh, from oil and gas. Uh, and it, this leads to some really, really interesting outcomes. Uh, for example, take the example of Egypt, which has large, uh, large natural gas resources, still major discoveries are being made, absolutely unlimited sunshine, uh, Egypt with very attractive conditions, and it became a major LNG importer uh, in the past couple of years because uh, under the current regulatory regime, uh, the natural gas prices and electricity prices kept at an artificial low level, so nobody invests in uh, gas upstream, uh, nobody invests in solar power. Uh, the, if, you, uh, if you had the value of gas uh, in Egypt, which is the export parity, because they used to be a gas exporter, solar power in Egypt would be in the money without a single cent of subsidy, uh, just on the basis of the very attractive climate. Instead, you have uh, LNG imports and electricity shortages at the same time, uh, is, uh, which, is a, which is a very, very undesirable uh, combination. Uh, the, you have very similar. You have a very similar problem in, in India, where in India you have crippling electricity shortages and underutilized power generation capacity uh, at the same time. In the past year, the average load factor of, of the existing power generation capacity in India has declined. So India will have to build new power plants. No doubt about that. But even the existing power plant fleet uh, has a declining utilization while you have 300 million people without electricity. Why is the reason for that? Is that the, is that the way the Indian electricity sector is currently regulated, uh, the state uh, distribution companies, almost all of them are bankrupt, they cannot pay for the electricity, uh, and, the, uh, and there, are no, there are no viable uh, contractual structures between the power generators and the, uh, uh, and the utilities. Now, uh, on the other hand, there's a very, very good news uh, here, and namely, that the that the negative the negative impacts of this uh, uh, phenomenon that I described this goes way way beyond climate change simply because the very because you have uh, uh, you know cities like Cairo or Delhi experiencing frequent blackouts uh, which you know air conditioner shutting down at 50 degrees in a Cairo summer is is something which gets the attention of the political decision makers uh, so we so we so we certainly uh, we, we certainly see uh, a, very, a very positive phenomenon uh, of, uh, and I should highlight two countries, uh, two very large and very important countries, India and Indonesia, where the current governments are doing a, a very smart, very well designed and, and very brave, I should say, uh, reform uh, of energy pricing. Uh, this is a major progress, and we also have to we also have to acknowledge that I was personally involved in eliminating the post-communist uh, energy sub subsidies uh, in Hungary. Uh, I can add that the prime minister who approved it lost the next election. Uh, so the so this is a politically socially sensitive process where you you shouldn't imagine that you can solve the problem one day to another. I would say some of the basic principles are that that the that you have to. Uh, that the government has to think about the social consequences very, very carefully, because typically it is not the very poor people who suffer when you reform energy, uh, energy prices. In fact, in both India and Indonesia, the bottom 20% of the population who use uh, kerosene lamps uh, or, or any of uh, you know, some locally biomass and so on, they actually spend more on energy than the middle class who has access to modern energy services. Uh, the, so, so you have to have, uh, uh, it's not purely an economics issue, you have to have a very careful social policy and you have to have a very clear communication and there, are, there could be some social groups whom you, whom you will have to have some, some targeted social assistance to manage the transition. Uh, but uh, we don't see much progress in the Middle East unfortunately, but in, in, in India and Southeast Asia we do see uh, a significant progress. 
Thank you. Well, one of the places where you need to have this uh, combination of public policies and private investment that uh, bears a lot on today's conversation is nuclear. In the United States, uh, nuclear is still about 19 percent of our power generation, but 60 percent of our carbon-free power generation. Uh, since the MIT study of 2003, I think the global share of nuclear has declined from 16% uh, to like 11%, not unrelated obviously to Fukushima. Um, we are now four years past Fukushima. There is about 66 reactors getting built globally, almost half of those being built in China. Uh, I'd like to ask the panelists, and there, all, all of you have views on this, so uh, I'll let this be a jump ball. What role do you see nuclear playing in the future as, as part of the long-term solution to the carbon problem? I'll start. I, I, well, for, I, for one, can't imagine a uh, zero carbon future that doesn't have uh, nuclear in as, as part of the solution, certainly as baseload power. Um, Certainly, the challenges of, of dealing with intermittent renewables like solar and wind uh, pose day-to-day -day challenges, but the seasonal challenges, particularly for solar, are really daunting to try to address with something other than a, a large baseload uh, resource like fission. <clears throat> the good news in, in fission is, is that there's a lot of new technology coming down the road. I, I don't know if this will surprise you or not, but there, there are at least some 43 startup companies uh, out there in the fission space. Um, maybe more surprising, there are at least three startups in the fusion space um, out there, and some new ideas in fusion coming down the road. So when I say a future for, for nuclear, I, I actually include uh, fusion in there. I think there's some interesting new ideas that may break away from the traditional approach with the eater, uh, where there are groups, uh, MIT's one, but there are other groups around the, the world looking at um, how to bring some new technologies to bear on, on fusion to maybe do it uh, a better, faster, uh, and cheaper. Um, a, a, an example at MIT is, is um, uh, a program that's looking at some new superconducting materials that allow you to get to twice the magnetic field strength before you lose superconductivity uh, in these superconducting tapes. If you get a factor of 2x in the magnetic uh, field, you can decrease the volume of the reactor uh, by 2 to the fourth power. Uh, so you get a significant decrease in volume of, of the reactor, uh, which allows you to build what, what they refer to as a small uh, modular mm -hmm. fusion reactor, 250 uh, megawatt reactor. Mm -hmm. But there are other interesting advances there too. Uh, 3D printing technology that lets you uh, machine, what, let, lets you print parts that you can't machine, uh, alloys that aren't machinable, and also use of, of uh, uh, molten salts to capture the energy from these fusion reactors, uh, which avoids some of the problems with material degradation. There are quite serious problems in. Uh, typical fusion approaches. So. Thank you, Bob. Tim, it looks like you have a comment here. I'll just uh, I'll, <clears throat> I'll, uh, support Bob's comment that nuclear clearly has a place in, uh, in the energy future. It's a base load capability. It is a zero greenhouse gas emission capability. And depending upon the circumstances of any given country, nuclear can be an uh, important way of securing energy security and reducing emissions. So uh, we continue to invest in nuclear technology. Uh, we see opportunities for both uh, the, the most immediate next generation of nuclear technologies and some of the more advanced technologies that Bob yeah. is talking about and have every reason to believe that that's going to be part of the future energy mix. Thank you. I saw, I saw some lit microphones in the back. Does that imply we can offer uh, the mic to the people in the audience? So please. Fire away, ma'am. Thank you. And if you could just um, identify I'm a Palacio, yourself. And I must confess that I have a nuclear past. And I say this because none of you have spoken about the big challenge, I mean, except for China, and you see it with Hankley and, uh, and the UK. The big challenge of nuclear is the perception of nuclear. What do you think that you have to do? And when I say you, meaning companies, but also governments, 
What do you think that we haven't done? And I mean companies, and I, and because we have less the public space to the anti-nuclear. That's a great question. I, I'm regretting that I'm the moderator, but I am, so I'm going to turn to our panel. Mike, do you want to take that? So, Dan, do you want to answer that question? I, I do, but I'm not going to. Okay. Uh, so All right. I, but I, well, I'll, I'll, I'll pick up on it, even though I'm a banker, but in long past is not a banker. Um, back in the 1980 era, as the strategic planner of GE's power business, we did a couple of interesting things. Uh, one was uh, to decide on a $20 million, 10-year investment. This will be a little aside. I'll come back to your question in a second. I don't want to support you on one thing. Uh, GE, the way GE does things. And that is we, we made a decision, 20, 20, a, a $20 million, in those days was a lot of money, 10-year commitment to invent the coatings on gas turbine blades and buckets that would allow the firing temperature of a gas turbine to be increased from 1,600 degrees to 2,350 degrees to get the 60% efficiency that was in the plan in 1980. It would take 10 years to get there. And the importance of those coatings is that 2,350 degrees is above the melting temperature of the steel that the turbine is made of. And so the firing temperature in these turbines is above the temperature that would melt the steel in these things. This is amazing technology. It, this this is, and that's what this latest generation of turbines is now actually utilizing. We're at 2350. And that was a 1981 strategic plan. All right, so many of these investments in nuclear or gas turbines are highly technical and so forth. Uh, but aside from that, let me, let me say as a context, and Dan and I have talked about this, in my view, we're going to achieve <coughs> carbon-free economy, I, I honestly believe we're going to achieve this because not of one thing, not of nuclear, not of efficiency, not of 60% this or whatever, but all of it together. And what I see is a wave of five, and I'll come back to nuclear, five technologies that are the answer is a package coming at us. Number one is efficiency. We're going to be more efficient, consume less energy. This is very important. And this is what's happening in the US market today. Not so much in India today, but okay, it's gonna get there. China's gonna be number, number two on efficiency. They're very hard on this. Uh, the, the obvious thing happening is renewable energy, wind and solar particularly, that are gonna generate intermittent or not continuous baseload power. But since uh, you and I both have engineering degrees, we know the only issue in dealing with intermittency is that engineers should do some work. <laughs> Why did they get paid? <laughs> you know, <laughs> this is not supposed to be easy, okay? I mean, if we can do 2,350 degrees, all right, we, we can deal with intermittent solar, okay? This is like trivial. This is like whining if people don't like that. All right, it's just engineers working there. Okay, so that's not a problem. Uh, but the next is uh, smart grid and storage, which I combined together, which is right now we have a dumb grid. We have generation, we have demand, and the, the really magical thing here if you're an electrical engineer, how many people here are electrical engineers? Anybody? No? Oh, we have a couple? Okay, good. So am I. Okay. Hello. Is a magic is that you have to generate uh, uh, moving electrons instantaneously the same as demand. This is it's amazing what utilities do. And that's why the model is not going away. This utility model does a job. All right, so there's, there's this smart grid storage that's gonna balance all that. And, and then there's, there's um, a nuclear power. Okay, now we're to nuclear power. This is the base load. People say we have 300 years of fossil fuels. Okay, well, let's mentally go out 300 years and say, so, okay, we ran out. Now, what do we have? And we have solar and nuclear. That's it, I'm sorry, that's it. So we're gonna run this society long-term on solar and nuclear. So nuclear is here to stay. Now, I would just posture two things which are a little controversial here, and Dan knows I'm going to say this, uh, just briefly. And that is, I do not believe the people are against nuclear power. I do not. I believe people are against how we're managing nuclear power. If they're against nuclear power, it's over. If they're against how we're managing it, we can start fixing that tomorrow. Okay, this gives us hope. Maybe the problem is we're just not managing it correctly. 
maybe uh, there's lots, lots to be said about that. But the one thing missing that I will go back to my days, 1980, and, and that is that there was a discussion in 1979, 80, 81, about creating a global commercial nuclear power safety and certification agency. Okay? And because of Three Mile Island accident, we in the U.S. said, full stop, no, no, we're not going there. We don't want non-U.S. people talking to us about what we're doing. So the Three Mile Island accident really shut that off. No more talking about that. And I would like to put for our discussion, maybe we come back on that question, that maybe my mother is nervous about nuclear power because she's not confident we're managing, confident we're managing the safety as well as we could. In fact, under the IAEA rules, sovereignty is senior to safety. So every country is responsible for its own safety. And I would just, for discussion, put on the table at this very important conference the possibility that we raise open the question of a global nuclear safety agency that certifies every facility and every person in every facility so that we have a confidence that safety is being handled better. And the possibility that maybe nuclear moves ahead better if we have this different approach to managing safety. <coughs> okay? We could probably spend the, the whole day on nuclear, and I, I am going to say something, but I'm going to turn to my esteemed uh, colleague, uh, Bob Armstrong, first. I just wanted to in interject uh, two, two thoughts. One is um, education, I think, is, is really important. Um, that I think we, we need outreach to the public to educate them better about what is cap what what are capabilities of nuclear designs today. I don't think that people are aware of that. Um, there was a program back in the early days of nuclear. Um, most people in the room are way too young to know this, but uh, Walt Disney <laughs> had a program called Your Friend the Atom back in the 50s and 60s, basically talking to people, the average consumer, about uh, atomic energy, nuclear power. Um, there were trucks, vehicles that went around in little traveling demonstrations or, or uh, education um, opportunities. Some update of that would be, would be helpful. Second factor I, I think we, we ought to talk about is cost. I don't think it's just public um, attitudes. I think there is a cost problem uh, with nuclear. If I, if I look at the nuclear plants being built in the U.S. today, um, the costs are out of control on those. Uh, Southern is not having a good time with uh, the Vogel uh, plants, for example. i just make a couple comments, Anna, because it's a, a, a key question. Friedrich Nietzsche once said, the most common form of human stupidity is forgetting what it was we were trying to do in the first place. And that's why we called this the zero carbon panel. <laughs> I, honestly, I mean, I don't, I don't consider renewables or efficiency or nuclear per se a moral issue. I do consider saving the planet a moral issue. And so when I see a renewable portfolio standard, I cringe. I'd rather see a clean energy standard. Let's remember what we're trying to do, point one. Point two, the logical implication of that, and it's been spoken to by my colleagues, is we therefore have to get at the things that are tripping up nuclear. And cost, why is it so costly? It's because we let the whole supply chain and the talent pool disintegrate. And so, you know, we're doing things over and slowly. I was responsible for project management. It makes you want to weep at times. We've got to get the people back. This is Bob's early point about the talent. And it's also, we've got to get smarter about regulation. We can't just layer regulation on top of regulation. We'll, we'll strangle the thing to death, right? And we've got to address the back end and really smart things like the Blue Ribbon Commission in the U.S. have done it. The, the Finns have figured out how to do it. We've mm -hmm. got to get that. And, and frankly, we have to get the proliferation piece right. And then finally, I'm sorry, but if we have one more major accident, it's going to be game, set, match. So there's very little room for maneuver. But I agree with Bob to say I don't see us getting there overall unless we can fix this, this piece of it. And I, I, we got audience members, I'd like to get a couple of others because, again, we could, could we go to you, sir, and then, and then Jason Bordoff? Uh, can we get a microphone in the front row here? Thank you. And then Jason and then this gentleman. 
I totally agree with the view that nuclear uh, is a necessity for going forward. Uh, nobody, and probably that answers the question earlier, uh, nobody has talked about uh, the possibility of upgrading, for example, uranium to weapons grade, which means that uh, that becomes more dangerous, and that's why perhaps the negative perception that uh, people might have in general, and that's why perhaps governments are not promoting it as visibly. So is it the right of every government to have nuclear? And then who's going to be deciding who has nuclear or not? OK. That's a very big question. But, you know, yeah, I that's a like big question. That, you know? Everyone up here would answer, but only Laszlo is going to answer, because then we're gonna, we have to get other people speaking. And we have a two finger from Barbara Slavin after yeah. you. Yes, yeah. maybe ten, right ten, uh, The sign has gone up 10 minutes to go. Laszlo, can you answer this uh, gentleman's question? Just quickly also, uh, if yeah, I may. Go ahead. I thought the IAEA regulated the safety aspects of nuclear facilities. So why do we need another agency? Shouldn't we just improve the IEA? Laszlo. OK. Uh, no, we, we, we do believe uh, that uh, decarbonization without nuclear is more difficult and more expensive. We don't think it's impossible to decarbonize without nuclear, but it's certainly more difficult and more expensive. But I should also add uh, that, that the situation is worse than talking about the expansion of nuclear, because both in the case of Europe and the United States, even maintaining the existing level of nuclear production requires very optimistic assumptions. Uh, because this is a very old fleet built in the 1960s, 1970s, uh, and with a very challenging business model. Uh, so, so we see a very credible risk uh, of uh, both Europe and the United States has uh, very successful wind and solar deployment. But if you use the expansion of wind and solar production to compensate for the decline of nuclear, uh, that's a bad news. Now, uh, at the same time, I also have to say that uh, the question was what the industry and what governments can do for, for, from the industry, first of all. Uh, I have to say that in the past couple of years, there have been examples of nuclear operators lying about safety problems. There have been examples of nuclear operators falsifying documents of safety inspections. There have been examples of nuclear operators uh, uh, using substandard uh, components uh, and then uh, not submitting the proper documents. Uh, these are different countries across the world. There are examples, in, including my country, Hungary, of nuclear construction projects going ahead with, without any transparency at all. Okay? I mean, as a Hungarian citizen, I have no idea what my government agreed with Rosatom. It's, everything is classified. Uh, now, if you, if you do this, you shouldn't be surprised if people become skeptical. Okay, that's, that, 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 I mean, the industry, the industry really has to get its act together in governance and engagement with societies. Uh, the, that's one thing. Another thing uh, where the industry has to get its act together that if every single nuclear construction project is a multi-billion dollars cost management disaster, uh, then I have to say that these days Goldman Sachs is at least as skeptical about nuclear power than Greenpeace, uh, purely from a financial point of view. Uh, so, so the industry will start to deliver projects on budget on time. Uh, that, that is, again, uh, a very important part for nuclear to stay in the game. Thank you. I want to ask, uh, before anyone sallies forth on uh, Barbara's question, is there anybody from the IAEA in the audience? Because I would not be so vain as to speak on behalf of them. OK, in, in that case, I'm going to take a, a one-shot uh, effort to answer your question and, and Barbara's. Uh, the world in which we live, Governments are quite possessive of views that they consider of a sovereign character. And sovereign governments, I think, are going to continue to decide whether or not they pursue nuclear energy. It's the job, I think, of the global community to ensure that there's an infrastructure there to make sure that there is peer review and to make sure that there's a regulatory framework and safety culture and safety capability that makes sure that that decision, if made, is made prudently and then can be pursued effectively. It is not a fail-safe mechanism, but I think it is reality. And, and, and Barbara, to your point, after Fukushima, of course, the IAEA provided good offices in, in, in allowing uh, you know, very robust set of safety learnings and best practices to be developed. There's actually a whole, at this point, infrastructure. There's the Convention on Nuclear Safety. There uh, is the uh, International Nuclear Power Operators Organization uh, Guano, best practices are being promoted. Uh, I don't think that you see in the IAEA the same uh, level of authority enforcement that you get, for example, in the safeguard system on, on uh, tracking fissile materials. But certainly, 
uh, the IAEA promotes a safety culture and has provided a venue and a vehicle to propagate the learnings out of uh, Fukushima. So the notion of continuing to develop from that predicate, I think, is quite valid. I know, I know Jason Bordoff I saw had, did you get a microphone there, Jason? Had a question. Um, thanks, uh, it's a great panel, thank you. So the panel is about the future of carbon-free energy. And I'm not sure your mic is on. Uh, oh, now it is, yep. Okay. Um, I think when people talk, hear as much optimism as we've rightly heard about carbon-free energy or hear people like Michael Eckhart say things like, I believe we are going to get to a carbon-free future. I mean, it's a big statement, zero carbon. That's how we power the globe and pull a billion more people out of poverty and double the size of the energy system. But when they hear that, the takeaway from that is, therefore, um, we shouldn't be investing in carbon-based energy. And I would be interested to hear Lazo or other members of the panel talk about how uh, carbon-free energy relates to investment today in carbon-based energy, particularly natural gas. And can we think about getting to the kind of future you're talking about? Does that mean, uh, is it necessary that that needs to be accompanied by a build-out of how we think about natural gas in the energy system today? Or actually, do we need to sort of just double down uh, the kind of movement that has built up to try to keep it in the ground, to think about uh, transitioning much more quickly toward a carbon-free future? means that actually there should be much less of a role, much more quickly, for carbon-based energy sources. Thank, thank you. I'm going to uh, toss that one first to Laszlo. I was hoping someone would ask that question so you could speak to this, Laszlo, and I know Tim wants to say something. Laszlo and Bob. Sure. So the, the, so the first thing is that the, you know, 450 ppm pathway, uh, the overwhelming majority of the emission decline comes from decline in fossil fuel use and a very small proportion of the emission decline comes from carbon capture and storage. So the, so the, the idea that, that we, have, we will have carbon capture and storage deployment and uh, then we continue the, the, the fossil fuel use is, is very, very unlikely in our view. Uh, in fact, uh, there are certain applications, uh, for example, steel, cement, uh, fertilizer production, which are very large emission sources, uh, and it's it's not it's not possible to cement, to produce cement with wind power uh, or fertilizer with solar panels. So their carbon capture and storage will be the only game in town. Uh, but that plays a minor role, and especially in the power generation sector, uh, in countries where you have old coal-fired power plants, they will they will just simply shut down most of them. Uh, now, having said that, in Asia. There was so much investment in new coal-fired power generation capacity that one third of all the coal-fired power plants operating in planet Earth are less than 10 years old uh, currently. I mean, this is not bad for a dying industry. Uh, mm -hmm. the, uh, so, so in Asia, there will have to be a lot of uh, there will have to be a lot of uh, retrofitting with carbon capture and storage uh, because it's a bit naive to assume that those plants will be shut down in the 2020s, uh, given that they represent hundreds of billions of dollars of value. For natural gas specifically, in a 450 ppm pathway, uh, we have around, around 1,000 billion cubic meters less uh, natural gas demand than in, uh, uh, in, the, in the baseline case, uh, which means that you invest much less in upstream. Specifically in the North American context, this is not a problem because shale gas has short, such a short investment cycle. You don't really have stranded assets. Uh, the, uh, if you observe demand going down, you simply deal less for shale gas. For large heavy, long lead time infrastructure projects, anything in the Arctic or big offshore projects and so on, that could become an issue. Okay. I've been given the three minute warning by our bosses in the back row, uh, and I have got three panelists who have offered to speak to this issue, so Jason will have had the last question. Before, I'm going to give you each one, one minute, you get, we're going to be bounced out of this room. I want to acknowledge that Ellen Williams is here, who is the leader of DARPA and uh, RPE. Uh, <laughs> How did I make that mistake? But uh, and want to thank her for her outstanding public service and, and keeping us at the cutting edge. Uh, but I'm going to just uh, go down the line here, Bob. Uh, well, let's uh, let's come this way, Mike, Tim, and Bob. I'm going to be ruthless on this one minute thing because otherwise we're going to get in trouble. So one minute. Uh, I believe we're 50 years into a 100-year transition to a clean energy future. To Jason's point, the reason I believe we're going to get there is simply looking at the evidence of how far we've come and where we are in everything happens in an S-curve format. I mean, this is very much like autos taking over horses. Those that own horses didn't think much of autos. 
those that were doing autos thought a lot about their future and could see their competitive advantage. And all public policy is now driving towards a carbon-free future. There is no public policy that I'm aware of that is trending towards or away from a carbon-free future. It's all trending in that direction. And we're now up to a $350 billion, being a banker, $350 billion a year industry investing in clean energy. Uh, we're at about $650 billion a year in fossil. So it's gradually taking over a situation. When does it become the majority? Soon. And so therefore, just looking at the evidence of what we're dealing with, the trend is that this is the winning hand. Thank you. And will replace what has been very successful in the past. I think the fossil fuel industry peaked in its success about 1980 and has been challenged since and will eventually succumb to the clean energy uh, going forward Thank simply you. on the evidence of public policy. Excellent. Tim. Uh, so Jason, first of all, specifically, at, in our company, we are certainly continuing to invest in uh, oil and gas capability and, um, as I mentioned before, in technology to utilize coal more efficiently. So. Um, there's no doubt about it. We're going to continue to invest. We see that as part of the picture for some time to come. Let me just mention something we didn't talk much about, which is a fundamental part of this entire equation, which is what's the role of the public sector? We talked mostly about private sector and technology. But to get to where Mike is confidently predicting the world is going to get in 100 years, you have to have a public policy framework. And there is, so there is a role for government here that is absolutely imperative. There needs to be a, a legal and regulatory structure that guides the private sector investment that I spoke about. And that means you need, there's lots of ways to do that, but that investment has to be sustainable. It has Thank to you. continue for a long, long period of time, which means it has to be profitable. And that's something that just has to be considered as, as, uh, as an essential here. There's also a role for government in research. So the, the other thing that has worked really well is government research in basic science and early phase technology, and then partnering with the private sector to take that technology and develop it into something that's commercializable, which can then be the basis of the investment that I just talked about. So really, there's that connection between government creating the foundations and the framework and some of the technology, and then creating the conditions in which the private sector will make the further investments that really make the, the technology be applicable and work. Thank you. Bob, you get the last word. Okay, so uh, I, I also agree that uh, fossil fuels will be needed uh, in the interim uh, to get us from, from here to there. Uh, th there are places where we can't do it out. For example, seasonal storage for intermittent renewables solar, particularly something we don't know how to deal with uh, yet. Uh, natural gas is, a, is an ideal way to do that for the, the next couple of decades, uh, say. Transportation is an area where we don't know how to, to decarbonize uh, yet uh, cost effectively. Don't think a Tesla is the answer for the average, uh, average consumer. Uh, there are opportunities uh, to, to, to use these fossil fuels more efficiently, more, more carbon responsibly. CCS retrofits with new technology that doesn't require the kind of uh, steam replumbing uh, that current uh, aiming uh, technologies require. And then lastly, uh, uh, more efficient um, operations uh, throughout. Um, and these can be shared across fossil energy technologies and uh, zero carbon technologies. For example, better power, uh, power cycles on the back end, supercritical CO2, could be used on uh, natural gas, uh, power plants, but ultimately could be used on, on fission or fusion uh, power plants as well. Thank you. We, we could go on, but we can't go on. There will be a coffee break from 10.45 to 11. The next session will begin at 11 a.m. Iraqi Kurdistan's energy outlook and towards the European Energy Union. Uh, please wear your credentials at all times. Leave your translation headsets in the room. Please join me in thanking our panelists.